I'm Tom Malagany for Inside EVs, and today we're going to be talking about electric vehicle manufacturer Xping Motors. Xping is based in Guangzhou, China, and while they've only been making electric vehicles for about three years now, they've rapidly moved to the forefront of the electric vehicle industry in China, or as they call it in China, the new energy vehicle industry. Personally, I prefer alternative fuel vehicles because I guess electricity isn't a new energy, but hey, that's up to China, whatever they wanna call the vehicles is fine with me as long as they support the electrification of personal transportation. And it appears as the Chinese government is doing that, so good on them. A big reason why Xpeng has been getting so much attention lately is because they're positioning themselves to be the premier smart EV company in China. And in doing so, they're placing an extreme focus on developing intelligent advanced driver assist systems. Like Tesla, Xpeng is developing its own proprietary self-driving software in-house to power its Navigation Guided Pilot, or NGP. They're not relying on third-party suppliers for its software, as most other OEMs do. Now, doing so is extremely cost-intense, but I believe in the long term, the benefits are worth it. Xpeng has three parts to its advanced driver assist systems, the first of which was released in January, and that's high-speed navigation-guided pilot. Uh, that works on highways and some secondary roads. Uh, then there's City Speed Navigation Guided Pilot, which is scheduled to be released in the first quarter of 2022. The last part is their Ultra Low Speed Advanced Driving Assist Systems, and that goes far beyond self-parking. And that's going to enable the vehicle to map out parking garages and memorize the layout of up to 1,000 meters. The vehicle can then enter the garage or the parking lot and drive itself around, hunting for an open parking spot and parking itself once it finds one. Now, Xpeng calls this Valet Parking Assistant, or VPA. We're hearing that VPA is going to be sent to Xpeng P7 owners that have uh, Xpilot 3.0 hardware very soon through an over-the-air update. Unfortunately, Xpeng G3 owners won't get this feature. As those vehicles come with Xpilot 2.5, that's not capable of accepting VPA. VPA requires no input from the driver. In fact, the driver technically doesn't even have to be in the vehicle. The car can find its way through the parking garage and park in an open spot. However, due to Chinese regulations, a driver is always required to be in the car. So while the vehicle technically can do it, the driver still has to sit in the car and just let the vehicle find its way to a parking spot. At least that's what the customers are supposed to do. A couple of months ago, I hosted here on Inside EVs a live stream event in which we talked about Xpeng's recent media drive. What they did was they got 15 P7s and a whole bunch of journalists, and they started this 2,300 mile drive across China uh, to demonstrate how well navigation guided pilot works. And during this entire drive, uh, the drivers weren't required to do the entire 2,300 mile drive. So let's say you were a, a journalist from a certain media outlet. You could say, oh, I'll drive a, a 500 mile leg or a 200 mile leg. And then they scheduled it so somebody else would take the car. But all 15 cars drove this 2,300 mile uh, journey. And Xpeng was recording all of the data on all of the cars during this drive. The goal was to see what percentage of the entire drive the cars can be on navigation guided pilot and how many times a driver had to intervene. And the, the, the event went fantastically for Xpeng and they finished up uh, after eight days and they posted the data. During this drive, all of the cars combined to have a success rate of over 94% for lane changing and overtaking. 
they were over 92% successful for highway ramp entering and exiting, and they had nearly a 95% success rate for entering and driving through tunnels, which there are a lot of in China due to its mountainous terrain. During the live stream, I had the opportunity to talk to Xping Motors Vice President of Autonomous Driving Technology, Dr. Xinjo Wu, and ask him some questions about their system. Like, why is it so important uh, to develop all your software in-house, um, comparing your system? Not really comparing, but um, I asked him if he thought that it was a bad idea for Tesla to just use a camera-only system when they're using cameras plus radar plus LiDAR um, to get to full autonomy. And uh, you might be interested in hearing uh, his comments. It surprised me a little bit what he had to say. Um, in any event, since we played this during the live stream, uh, we really haven't showed anybody the, this recording since. I thought it would be a good idea to bring it back up. It was only a couple months ago and embed it into a video to give more of the Inside EVs community a chance to hear Dr. Wu's comments. So I'm gonna play that video now, and uh, it's only about 17 minutes long, but I think it's really fascinating, and it was uh, very uh, interesting for us to be able to get a hold of somebody so high up in uh, any one of the uh, OEMs that's in charge of autonomous driving, which is such an important feature today, and what so many people are interested in. One of the questions we get uh, you know, most on Inside EVs, when a new electric vehicle hits the market, like the ID4 or the, the Mustang Mach E or the new Chevy Bolt EUV, is everybody asks us, how is the self driving? You know, how is it uh, the, uh, you know, advanced driver assist systems? Um, Tesla set the bar so high that everybody wants to know is it like autopilot? Is it better than autopilot? What works well? What doesn't work well? So I think the subject of autonomous driving features is something that people really are interested in. And that's why I think this interview really works here now. So we're gonna jump over to that now, and then I'll come back at the end for some final thoughts. Well, I'd like to introduce Dr. Xinjo Wu, who is the Vice President of Autonomous Driving at Xpeng Motors. Thanks for coming on the webcast, Dr. Wu. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, well we're gonna, we're, Xpeng is undertaking this incredibly ambitious event now, driving 3,600 kilometers on uh, NGP, which is, you know, probably the longest any autonomous driving event has taken effect, especially when you consider it's not just one vehicle, it's a fleet of production vehicles. These aren't pilot test vehicles. So this is, um, it's super interesting and something that our followers here on Inside EVs are really interested in. So, you know, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the technology in the vehicles and why Xpeng positions themselves as a leader in this technology. Um, particularly, you know, one of the things I find really interesting is the software. Uh, Xpeng is developing all of its software in house. Now, many other car manufacturers, a lot of your competitors, go to outside third parties like Mobileye, for instance, but you've taken it upon yourself to develop all of your software in-house. Why is that so important? Sure, uh, you know, x Motors is a smart EV company. And uh, actually we uh, see ourselves, uh, you know, uh, the key differentiator for our company against our competitors is really the smart part. So probably not many people know this. Uh, actually, right after the company is founded, uh, the vision is really try to develop the autonomous driving technology in house. So right after actually, um, you know, the co company was founded probably five six years ago, we started to put people on, uh, you know, um, developing the uh, uh, you know automated parking system, which was uh, basically uh, uh, got into uh, production essentially uh, in our first vehicle model G3. And then, uh, um, you know, right now, obviously, we are working pretty hard on uh, NGP, which was released to customer um, uh, three months ago. And that has, uh, you know, um, gained uh, pretty good, I think, customer uh, recognition and the market attraction uh, at this point. Um, and uh, um, uh, the other reason is that uh, um, because, uh, you know, we want to make sure 
oh, you know, um, you know, we have a leading position in autonomous driving. Uh, being able to develop the technology fully in-house has a lot of advantage uh, because we can, uh, you know, close the loop uh, within the company. We can run much faster and we can utilize the uh, basically data we can collect from our, uh, you know, the customer fleet uh, much more efficiently. So all these advantages basically, um, you know, give us an edge um, if we have the uh, technology fully in-house. Um, and the other part is also important, um, um, you know, which is the localization part, which we'll, uh, you know, talk a little bit more about this as well, uh, because uh, the software we develop are for the China market. If we adopt a, a technology from a, uh, let's say, international uh, big tier ones like Mobileye, um, me, uh, you know, much of their solutions are not really well tailored um, to fit into the Chinese road condition and the Chinese uh, driving uh, kind of uh, um, habits. So uh, it's uh, uh, very, very important for us to be able to uh, basically tune the software ourselves. Um, and that also basically says we pretty much have to build the technology in-house. That makes a lot of sense. And you teed up a great question. Why is Chinese roads or why are Chinese roads so challenging? I've heard this from quite a number of OEMs that it's, you know, the, you can't develop autonomous driving uh, for the US or Europe and then just take it and put it into China. It, it, there's a lot of different challenges. It won't work as well. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. Uh, well, uh, to be fair, um, you know, it's just different. It's not necessarily more challenging as compared to, you know, crowded European cities or um, uh, US cities. Um, but, it, it's, it's, you know, the Chinese road condition, number one, is they are very different. Uh, for example, the lane lines. The lane lines, uh, basically, the lane line types in China, I think, uh, probably had the most types as compared to any anywhere else in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the world. So uh, being able to recognize these different kind of lane types and being able to understand the semantic meanings of this uh, is uh, of these uh, lane lines are very important. Actually, are the probably the first thing you need to do correctly, uh, basically, uh, you know, to to enable uh, autonomous driving. And also, uh, um, basically, in China, there's one thing which is very particular. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of the, the, the law enforcement on the road through security cameras is much more strict. Uh, there's a lot of the electronic basically eyes, that's what we call them. And if you are uh, trespassing, you are doing a lane change where you are not supposed to, then you get a ticket automatically. <laughs> so um, like solid lane line change is a big no-no in China. So, um, and uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, things get complicated very, very quickly because there's uh, uh, this fishbone uh, lane line, which means that you have to slow down, but it can be a combination between basically fishbone, which is slow down and the solid. And also there can be difference but on the left side and you, you have a lane line essentially, on the left side it's dash, on the right side it's solid. On top of that, you have fishbone. <laughs> so there's many combinations you need to recognize and you need to make sure you do not do lane change when you are not supposed to. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a international solution, if they're not trained on this kind of data, then you might not be able to uh, recognize this kind of scenarios. Then basically you can get into the customer into trouble, especially uh, when we are getting into high level of, uh, you know, autonomous driving, you are, the, the software is taking you uh, you know, end to end, uh, uh, you know, on the highway, essentially it's doing, uh, you know, automatic lane change um, to avoid uh, bad traffic and uh, based on navigation, all these, uh, these are essential. So being able to do that correctly, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, uh, this is just one aspect of it. And the other one is uh, probably, um, you know, um, uh, you know, even on the localization side, which means the position the vehicle accurately um, you know, the requirement in China is also quite different because China is a very, actually many parts of the China, there's a lot of hills and mountains. As compared to in US, actually most of the cities are basically, you do not see like tunnels that often. But in China, like uh, where I am right now in Guangzhou, like uh, tunnels are everywhere. Being able to uh, get through these tunnels without being interrupted in the sense you still 
uh, being engaging NGP is, 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 is very, very important. That's why we spend a lot of time to tune our localization solutions using GPS and using HD maps so that we can actually um, navigate, uh, you know, very, very long tunnels without basically, um, you know, have to quit the uh, function. Uh, actually, in comparison, uh, you know, the company you mentioned, Tesla, basically, um, as, uh, their solution right now, actually, they have to pretty much uh, quit uh, NOA, I think, right? It's, yeah, NOA, um, um, whenever they get into a, a tunnel. So this is a quite a big difference. It's, you know, it's, uh, so being, our capability in the customer to have less disruption uh, when they have to deal with tunnels. And number three is also important the, is the driving habits. In China road, basically, um, 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 there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, different types of vehicles, probably have more varieties uh, as compared to the US road. For example, tricycles and the basically uh, electric bikes, the bikes, they're very, very common in China. And mm -hmm. the food delivery personnel, they basically, they ride um, uh, these electric bikes and they can appear anytime from anywhere around the vehicle. <laughs> so being, I know, uh, and also, I've driven in China, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And also the other thing is that people do very aggressive cut-ins <laughs> yeah. as if you're not there. So, uh, you know, actually in US, I have, uh, you know, obviously I drive in, in both countries, but uh, in US, I think uh, I would say the driving pattern is much more benign. So being able to handle aggressive cuttings is definitely absolutely needed uh, for to develop the software, uh, you know, in China. So, anyways, there's many many different aspects, uh, you know, of uh, uh, how do you make the software right uh, again for Chinese uh, road conditions and Chinese customers. So, um, uh, so that's why you know localization uh, or being able to do this, uh, tune the software work well. Uh, you know, for in Chinese uh, roles and Chinese environments are really, really important to 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 um, you know build a good product for the Chinese customers. Okay, um, so that and you, you actually teed up another question. You had mentioned um, just then that going through tunnels can be particularly challenging, and that uh, for instance, Tesla vehicles, who's who's um, you know uh, obviously a big competitor, um, they the autopilot needs to quit quite often if it's entering through a tunnel. Now, Tesla just recently announced that they're gonna be dropping the radar from their autonomous driving technology. Um, right now, it's a camera-based system with, with radar. And, and they're basically saying they don't even need the radar, it's gonna be just cameras. Now, Xpeng's taken that in a totally different direction. You're uh, using LiDAR, I think five high-precision millimeter wave radars, you've got 13 cameras. You're using, it seems like everything 14. that you could possibly put it. How many now? 14 cameras. 14, okay, sorry, I thought 13. Yeah, I think you snuck one in on me there, you added one. But um, uh, so, you know, you have got this huge suite of technology in there. You're not relying on, on one particular uh, technology. Could you maybe explain why you think that's the right decision for x to do? Sure, I think there's a, a few different angles you can look at this. Number one is really about the complementary natures of the uh, capabilities of different sensors. Uh, you know, camera is a wonderful sensor and uh, you know, you can argue that human have eyes, they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, analogous to the, uh, you know, cameras you use in the cars, right? If human, human can drive with eyes, supposedly cars can drive with cameras only. Um, but a camera, essentially, uh, they have their, uh, you know, if you look at the cameras and it's really a projection of 3D information into a 2D plane, right? Um, and then uh, basically, um, you know, the depth information is sort of, a, uh, you know, lost in that process. You need to do a lot of advanced algorithms to be able to recover that depth or this 3D information from the camera sensory, uh, you know, information. On the other hand, the sensory, you know, cameras that advantage is basically um, you know, the, uh, the, the density of pixels or the information is much, um, much more as compared to order of magnitude actually higher than uh, millimeter wave, uh, uh, millimeter radar or basically, uh, or, or LIDAR actually, even, even when we compare to LIDAR. So you can uh, derive very rich, um, I would say semantic information uh, about the objects using camera sensor. Um, um, and that radar, you know, on the other hand, 
uh, you know, the information is coarse, but it has a direct measurement of the uh, 3D information, which is the depths. And also on top of that, which is also important, it also measure the speed of the object directly. That's uh, in other words, you know, uh, uh, in more technical terms, it's a Doppler basically measurement. You come from uh, uh, the uh, electromagnetic waves. Um, and the LIDAR, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know um, it's also a light sensor, um, but uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, uh, measuring the uh, basically round trip time between the uh, uh, transmitting and the receiving uh, uh, of the light, uh, then basically you can measure uh, pretty much uh, the depth information uh, pretty easily. So uh, with LIDAR, essentially it gives you a, um, uh, a, a, almost like a free, 3D uh, drivable space, which is uh, you know quite easy to use when you um, when you uh, when you have it. So uh, essentially, these three sensors they are quite different, and they have their strengths and weakness uh, in different areas. Obviously, if you uh, basically work hard on one of them, for example, camera, as uh, you know Tesla is doing, you can um, you, when you, uh, your algorithm getting stronger and stronger, you can basically derive the 3D world as well. Um, but it takes a lot of effort and also the performance, um, you know, uh, we still believe that a sensor fusion, which, uh, you know, kind of approach, which kind of combine the uh, kind of strengths of different sensors is still a better uh, approach and a more robust approach. So, um, um, you know, if you look had again a, a, a complicated, uh, I would say, basically uh, driving scene, right? When you are trying to pass the intersection with a lot of basically um, uh, the electric bikes, which can appear anytime around you and uh, uh, people and uh, even pets. So uh, to be able to track these objects accurately, uh, their position, their velocity, and even their acceleration, you would like to actually uh, and inform and also ensure the safety of both the driver and the uh, objects around the vehicle, you want to have this kind of um, uh, you know accuracy in your in your perception capability, and that comes from a uh, um, you know a good combination of the, all these sensors. That's at least the way we see it. And number two is also important, which is the redundancy nature of a higher level of uh, of autonomous driving. I do believe that in a matter of, uh, you know, somewhere between, you know, four to five years, um, our software want to evolve to a high level with, uh, of, uh, of basic automation where a driver can get out of the loop at least for, for some time, essentially. Um, when that, um, that will, uh, you know, uh, requires that you have uh, a lot of redundancy in, this, in, the, in the system, uh, including your sensing capabilities. So uh, we believe that having all sensors in the vehicle uh, right now actually for our p7 for our current vehicle model we only have a, a 360 radar and the camera dual coverage um, but in the future we will add basically lidars in our next vehicle model uh, to, to the front sensing as well when we have these multiple levels of sensor and coverage we can achieve a much better redundancy for example in the worst scenario there can be a flying paper you know coming out of you and cover your camera, right? Maybe for a few seconds, but you do not want your vehicle to lose control. So we, in a sensor fusion, uh, basically approach, uh, uh, you know, even in this kind of scenarios, even driver is not paying attention and one of your sensors is getting com compromised, you can still maintain uh, the safety and the operational, uh, make the vehicle still operational in this kind of scenario. This is, uh, you know, essential to be able to get a high level of, of, of automation. Um, that's at least the technical direction we are going. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously we, uh, as many uh, technical folks working in this area, we all have a lot of respect for what Tesla is trying to do and we wish them all the best. Um, but we do believe that uh, at least uh, to be able to, number one, uh, basically to uh, be able to develop the technology in a very complex, environment uh, like uh, you know Chinese roads and number two to be able to uh, achieve the high level of uh, uh, autonomy uh, basically uh, to ensure redundancy you would need uh, multiple sensors to work seamlessly with, with each other. Well it makes a lot of sense and uh, listen I want to thank you for coming on today I know it's late in China now so you stayed up late for this and I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, congratulations on this 
3,600 kilometer uh, successful, nearly cross country drive on uh, navigate got na navigation guided pilot. Uh, it's really, you know, when 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 I first heard that XPEN was doing this, you know, I said, well, the, uh, this can go either way. You know, if 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 it's if if there's a lot of human intervention needed, if some of the journalists say, oh, it, you know, it didn't perform well. Uh, the, it was kind of a risky move, but it seems like you guys pulled it off and very successfully. So congratulations on that. And again, thanks for coming on. I'm sure the Inside EVs followers are going to appreciate this. All right. Thanks for having me again. Uh, thanks, Tom. Well, that was certainly interesting. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Wu for coming on and talking to us about XPeng and their advanced driver assist systems. Uh, one of the things I found particularly interesting when I asked him about Tesla and their recent decision to drop radar and uh, to go develop their systems without using LiDAR, I was kind of expecting him to be a little more hesitant uh, in uh, agreeing that they will be able to develop a full system with just cameras. I've talked to many other professionals from other companies and they all kind of roll their eyes when we talk about the fact that Tesla's only using cameras, they're not going to use radar, they're not going to use LiDAR, and they kind of give me this, well, good luck with that Tesla approach. But Dr. Wu didn't have that opinion. He flat out came and said they can get there with cameras alone. That's the first time I had somebody as high up in a position as he is in one of the OEMs tell me, look, um, Tesla can do this. It's just maybe going to take them longer or it, it requires, I think he said, uh, it just requires a lot of work. And I think it almost was like the LiDAR and the radar are shortcuts to get there. Um, and the redundancy gives that extra level of safety. But uh, he seemed to indicate, hey, you know, uh, they can get there with cameras, which, you know, is, is pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 th I thought that was the best nugget that I pulled out of there, that he actually, you know, you know, validated the fact that, uh, you know, he believes Tesla's going to get there just using cameras. Really cool. In any event, um, next up, we're going to be keeping our eye out for Xping's release of the valet parking assist. I mentioned it earlier. That's supposed to come relatively soon through an OTA software update. Now, we can't go over to China and test it out right now, or we would, um, due to obviously uh, the COVID travel restrictions that are still in place. But once it is available, we are going to set up a uh, video with a journalist that is based in China and uh, record some video and then talk about it and see how well the system works. But that's it for today. Let us know in the comments section, what's your opinion of Xpeng? Do you like what they're doing? Do you like uh, the fact that they're developing all their software in-house, is that the right way to go? Uh, let's have a discussion on that in the comments section below. Before you take off, don't forget, please click that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming content here on the Inside EVs YouTube channel.